Uh, welcome uh, to this first session of the uh, ETGEC lecture series. Um, uh, my name is Tony Denuso, and I, I direct the e East Texas Geriatric Education Center Consortium. Uh, the, as many of you may know, the mission is to provide geriatric, geriatric education and clinical training to health providers and students. And this series is an annual uh, event that we, we provide every year. We like to provide free CEUs and a chance to have some dialogue and some new ideas on, on current I, uh, concepts and things going on in healthcare for older adults. So this uh, whole series will be about the care of the older patient. Uh, this first session is about ma management of comorbidities, disease, and prevention. Uh, I would like to acknowledge our partnership with the Texas AHEC East and, and their invaluable help to me to uh, get connected to all our different consortium partners throughout East Texas. Uh, this is going to be also accessed on webinar and there's a link there and I'm going to give a phone number where we can call in for some uh, numbers for those that are uh, connecting with the streaming on the, uh, on the webinar. If you need to leave and you still want to see this but from your computer, there's the link. So you'll have that information. Uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, after my introduction, I'm, we're going to have Bronya Machenko, uh, a nurse in the ACE unit doing caring of a hospitalized patient, followed by medical decision making and care of the geriatric patient by Dr. Aaron Hummel. We'll have a short break and occupational therapy, then perspectives in the elderly population lo living long post hospitalization by Colin Adams. Okay, then there's evaluation forms and all these other things that you'll need to, com to uh, complete. So I said this is a series, we're going to have four sessions on this, and uh, there's in your handouts you have what we plan to do in February, April, and then in May. This is the purpose of today's session. Uh, the, the reason this came about is uh, we are funded by HRSA, the Health Service Resource Administration, and they really would like to uh, see a little bit more in terms of how uh, specifically, uh, health providers manage comorbidities among older patients. That's a big part of this. There's a lot of challenges and, and very complexities to go with managing those with multiple chronic illnesses. And this is what we hope to do today. These are the learning objectives that are also in your handout. I won't go through those, but hopefully these will be covered by our speakers. And I'm pretty sure I saw all the, all the material and the content, and it is excellent. Uh, we broadcast to our consortium partners to all our different sites, and this is who we have. We have today Victoria uh, College in Victoria, Texas, uh, Lamar University in Beaumont, also broadcasting to Weatherford College in Decatur, and also to SFA in Nacogdoches. Okay, we offer free CE credits uh, and for nursing. Uh, the, for this session, uh, we will have a sign-in sheet that you need to do, and then an online link where you will put in your evaluation form and get a certificate that will be sent to you. And uh, then you must be present for the entire uh, three hours to be uh, to obtain any CNE credits. Remember to sign in on the CNE sign-in sheet as well, and this will provide three uh, CNE contact hours. We have a disclosure that none of our uh, participants today have any financial, relevant financial uh, associations to disclose. And there are no conflicts of interest that have been identified. Okay, our first presentation is by uh, Bryony Machenko. Uh, she, is, uh, she has a number of, of degrees in nursing and received her basic nursing education in York Yorkshire, England. She immigrated to the U.S. and worked as a staff nurse in rural areas of Texas before moving to Galveston. Received her BSN and MSN from UTMB and has work experience including OB-GYN at MD Anderson, 15 years in emergence, emergence nursing and 15 years of nursing teaching experience at Galveston College. Uh, she's also worked on the acute uh, care unit, the ACE unit for the elderly uh, now for 10 years and is first employed as a geriatric nurse practitioner for five years, working with private community physicians, and is now currently employed as a clinical nurse educator on the ACE unit at UTMB. Uh, and she's responsible for all our teaching of geriatrics and the content 
for the hospital staff. Uh, she's on the GEC program planning committee. I really enjoy working with her. She's been a real big help. Why we have CNE credits is, is due to her. I'd really like to thank her for that. So uh, without further ado, Branya. Okay. All right. And the second, so my um, presentation is going to be on the hospitalized patient, because it's like, it seems where I've got the most experience at this point in time, uh, especially on the um, ACE unit. And the topic that I'm really going to um, portray is iatrogenesis. Uh, as far as uh, the ACE unit or the acute care unit at UTMB is concerned, we are a niche um, uh, unit, so it's a we are a niche hospital. And NISH actually stands for Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders. Okay. And this is a national organization. There's over 300 hospitals in the United States that actually belong to NISH. And it is a prestigious um, uh, to belong to this actual organization. So we're very, very fortunate. One of the nice things as far as NISH is concerned is NISH does provide a tremendous amount of education for geriatrics. And it's something that we use. And that's I can so as far as getting our nursing staff um, trained um, in geriatric concepts. And I think that Victoria um, College also um, um, uh, also have uh, initiated. As far as the objectives, today's objectives, we're going to look at the hazards of hospitalization in the elderly. And we're going to look at the what are the most common types of um, iatrogenesis and what does cascade iatrogenesis mean. And a second then we're going to look at what is your role, and it's like um, whether you're a physician or a nurse or a social worker, um, uh, or OTPT in preventing um, iatrogenesis in hospitalized patients. The, I, uh, I guess a, a government report, a federal uh, government report um, on why population aging matters um, kind of shows that the aging population is growing globally. Um, and it's like in 2006, they had estimated that we had 500 million older adults worldwide. And by the year 2030, the um, number will increase to 1 billion older adults um, throughout the, um, the world. Um, and it's like, and certainly as far as aging population is concerned, it is fastest growing in the um, developing countries. As far as the uh, core consumers are concerned, adults 65 and years and older just kind of compromise about 12% or 13% of the population. But when we're looking at healthcare, they are consuming 50% of um, the healthcare market. Uh, and a second, certainly as far as when we're looking as far as the um, hospitals are concerned, whenever we're looking as far as census is concerned, at least 50% of the patients on th in the hospital at any one time um, are 65 and older. So it's like it's a huge percentage as far as the market is concerned. Um, they do suffer from multiple complex medical problems in a second. So certainly as far as our geriatric patients, when they come into the hospital, they're not coming in with uh, just one little thing as far as their, uh, um, uh, uh, their conditions are concerned. It's just an MI or it's like hypertension. But it's like they've got um, a, a, a series of comorbidities that they bring with them. Um, certainly as far as the research is showing, it's like they do have a high rate of readmissions. Um, certainly that as far as our elderly patients are much more likely to become deconditioned and lose function. Uh, they certainly suffer a lot more complications and adverse events. Uh, and they're more, much more likely to die in the hospital and their length of stays tend to be um, much longer. And some of the um, the data shows that the older adults average anywhere from 7.8 um, days in the hospital compared to 5.4 days uh, for younger patients. Chronic disease, um, in a second, so at this point in time we are looking at a, an epidemic of chronic disease. The vast majority of um, older adults, at least 80% of them, have at least one chronic condition. They may have dementia, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, uh, osteoarthritis. Um, okay. 
uh, and it's like in today, the chronic disease is what is the leading cause of death. Whereas, what, 40, 50 years ago, it was an acute infection um, that was usually uh, the uh, cause of death, whereas now it is um, a chronic disease. Okay. Um, certainly, any time that you've got chronic disease, you also have a major risk of depression uh, and disability. Um, and the, um, uh, certainly as far as the more comorbidities that you have, the more you're going to use your health care um, services. The elderly patients also have a much higher incidence of um, cognitive impairment. So the, the research is showing that like 35% of um, our elderly patients oftentimes have some kind of um, cognitive impairment Oftentimes it's not recognized, and then 25% of these patients um, also have dementia. Um, those patients that have both cognitive and uh, physical comorbidities actually have a much longer um, length of stay. Um, patients who have dementia and congestive heart failure, um, heart disease, diabetes, COPD, as well as dementia, actually have a length of stay that is three times longer than the patient who just has the uh, f um, physical illness. And certainly as far as the, um, uh, the ACE unit is concerned, and as I can certainly as far as our patients with dementia um, and uh, delirium are concerned, those patients are a heck of a lot more challenging as far as nursing care is concerned, as most of our nurses will attest to. And as I can so it really does create tremendous challenges on our staff to be able to manage those patients. Okay, the next slide I'm going, we're going to talk about is iatrogenesis. And if I can, so anybody, any ideas, what, what is iatrogenesis? Negative effects of being in a hospital. <laughs> okay, all right, so these are some unattended adverse outcomes. Okay, and it's like it actually comes from the Greek word iatro, uh, meaning healer, and it's like and the genesis is brought on um, by the healer. Meaning that, and it's like through our treatments, we actually promote um, uh, things that we didn't intend, but it's like but have adverse outcomes. Okay, uh, and so the literature uh, is showing that about 36 to 58 percent of old adults, older adults, um, suffer from some form of iatronic disease during hospitalization. And I know that everybody's heard that, you know, certainly as far as hospitalization is concerned, it is, it is uh, not, not good as far as the elderly is concerned, and certainly there's an awful lot of literature that supports this um, in, in its research. Um, basically about one third to a half of all patients experience some harm um, during their hospital stay. Again, this is, it was, it's, it's un unintended uh, adverse outcomes. Okay. All right. Um, a there was a study, a, a landmark Harvard study that was done in 1991 um, that looked at um, iatrogenesis, and as I can, then the study was uh, replicated by Rothschild um, in uh, 2000 that did show um, that corroborated the, the uh, original results. But it's like certainly as far as the elderly are concerned, they do t tend to have a lot more perioperative um, complications. Um, Certainly, um, there's 10% more falls in the elderly uh, population than there is in the um, uh, regular po um, um, patients. Uh, and a second, then 2.5% more medication reactions, and then four times as many therapeutic uh, mishaps um, relating to um, uh, patients um, that's 65 and older. And as far as looking, as far as what are the reasons for some of these iatrogenic risk factors? Uh, some of these could be the normal age-related physiological changes that occur as far as the body is concerned. Some of them are related to um, chronic disease and comorbidity. And certainly as far as if I've got um, um, many chronic diseases, and it's like, and so therefore I'm going to be getting a lot more medications, and then the chances of um, uh, developing um, iatrogenesis is much, much greater. Certainly as far as our elderly patients are concerned, they do have um, a tendency to have very atypical uh, disease presentations, so that oftentimes 
um, it is a challenge to try and to figure out what is wrong with the patient. They certainly don't come in with the regular signs and symptoms that a younger person would come in with. Um, Provider um, beliefs and attitudes may also have an effect as far as iatrogenesis and harm is concerned. Okay? Uh, and certainly as far as inadequate training as far as geriatrics is concerned. Uh, and uh, as far as health providers. The first category that we're going to look at is just normal um, age, uh, aging changes. Uh, and it's like, and certainly as we um, age, there's the ability to respond to stress is uh, greatly decreased. Um, as far as the kidneys and the liver, cognitive function, there, um, there oftentimes is some decline. Homeostas hom homeostatic um, and compensatory mechanisms oftentimes are impaired. Um, there is an in increased infection risk. Uh, as far as the elderly is concerned, they do have a blunted thirst mechanism, so it's like oftentimes they're not even aware that they're dehydrated. Uh, and certainly as far as their cardiac reserve is concerned, it is reduced. Okay. Um, with the reduction as far as cardiac reserve is concerned, much more pr um, likely to develop iatrogenic congestive heart failure. Uh, The, uh, as far as chronic conditions and comorbidity is concerned, this, this is the second category. Uh, and it's because of the high prevalence of chronic disease and comorbidities in older adults. Um, so certainly, um, the more um, chronic diseases they have, the more medications they're going to have, and, and more interventions we're going to do, uh, which increases the likelihood of an adverse event. Okay. And then there is a boost as far as um, geriatric syndromes. Okay, uh, and certainly as far as geriatric syndromes are concerned, I'm going to go ahead and um, um, discuss that uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, all right. Certainly as far as unusual presentations of symptoms, um, oftentimes the symptoms may be very vague or very unusual. It's not unusual to uh, misinterpret. Um, some of the symptoms that the patient has, not just from the um, uh, clinician's perspective, but maybe from the family's and patient's perspective. Oftentimes the diagnosis som is somewhat delayed, and then oftentimes that will result in delay as far as treatment is concerned. Um, just over the Christmas period, we had a 76-year-old um, Hispanic male that was admitted, and it's like, and he did spoke very little English, uh, and he came in through, um, well, he'd gone to his uh, PCP, uh, and it's like, and he was becoming very lethargic, short of breath, and very fatigued, had a history of COPD, <coughs> hypertension, diabetes, uh, and the, his condition was so poor that the um, physician sent him <coughs> on to the emergency room. Um, he was admitted. They found that his cardiac enzymes were elevated, um, that his lactic acid was uh, elevated. He was hypotensive. He had an albumin of 1.6, and he um, was uh, diagnosed as far as malnutrition, uh, pneumonia, and sepsis. Uh, secondary to pneumonia. Okay, so he spent a couple of days down in the intensive care unit, and then came up onto the um, uh, ACE unit. Okay, um, during that period of time, and it's like in his condition improved um, somewhat, but it's like in, and um, probably about what, the th uh, fourth day that he was on the unit, we had PT and OT look at him, and it's like and then um, it was um, they found that. He really had an awful lot of pain when they were trying to walk him, and it's like, and they decided, uh, we decided to x-ray it, and it's like, and we found that he had a fractured hip. So you see that he had tremendous amounts of complications. It was very difficult to try and get through the, all of the problems. We didn't diagnose the fractured hip until almost, what, six days that he was in the hospital. Uh, certainly as far as communications um, were concerned, there was an issue as far as the Hispanic is, um, um, uh, communications were concerned, but certainly as far as his critical uh, condition when he first came in, and like, and so obviously respirations were the, his uh, um, pneumonia was the biggest priority um, before we finally moved. But you can see that certainly as far as care is concerned, it can be very, very complex, and we may not pick everything up until the, ver the very, very end. Okay. Certainly as far as some of the literature is showing that uh, many of our geriatricians, our geri not geriatricians, but many of our 
physicians or nurses are underprepared for the complexity as far as care is concerned um, relating to geriatrics. I know as far as nursing is concerned, nursing schools tend to pl place their first year students onto the geriatric unit thinking that this is an area where you know the patients are not complicated and it's like it's all about general care and it's like but they have no clue as far as how complicated and difficult um, that patient's um, um, condition is. And so that they just have a tremendous lack of understanding. Uh, and certainly as far as our physicians are concerned, those that don't have the luxury of an ACE unit and geriatricians teaching them, um, oftentimes they have very little knowledge as far as the complexity um, of, uh, as far as geriatrics is concerned. Kind of looking at the today's um, workforce, okay, and it's like as far as certified geriatricians are concerned, there's only 7,128 um, certified geriatricians in the United States. This means that there is one to 2,546 uh, patients um, as far as geriatricians are concerned. So certainly those, we are very, very fortunate as far as Galveston is concerned to have um, uh, geriatricians um, taking care of us and it's like to um, have that. And it's like, and certainly when I'm talking to some of the other niche hospitals, oftentimes they have no geriatricians at all. Um, uh, so, um, and it's like, or they may have one, okay. Um, certainly as far as nurses are concerned, less than 1% of our, our, our RNs of the 2.2 million nurses are actually certified in geriatrics. Um, there, as far as advanced practice nurses are concerned, there's only like 4,000 um, advanced practice nurses in geriatrics. Uh, social workers, there's less than 4% mm -hmm. that are certified as far as ge in geriatrics. Pharmacists, very, uh, very low, 1%. Um, and as far as the literature is concerned, it does show that training in ger geriatrics dramatically improves our care, okay, as far as the elderly are concerned. And certainly as far as um, UTMB is concerned, we are uh, trying to um, really push towards getting our uh, nurses geriatric certified and then also as, as far as geri geriatric resource nurses are concerned. And we actually have two of them that have just completed their geriatric nurse um, um, uh, classes. Uh, and I'm saying, so they're going to be our resource nurses now, so you're the experts at this point. Um, so we're really relying on you to teach others. Um, and um, hopefully they'll be certifying very soon and as I can then be our experts as far as geriatrics but there's a tremendous need um, relating to that we do have fellows out there that are um, in, in the back row down there somewhere that are also uh, there's not many of them just about four a year but it's like that's better than none right and it's like and so um, all of that is uh, is good um, certainly as far as a pharmacist is concerned with the complexity as far as medications are concerned I don't think that we're going to be able to go very much longer without having a pharmacist on the unit to try and to um, help us um, with um, some of the medications because it's like the medications are a huge issue. The three main um, iatrogenic complications um, that um, we, we see are oftentimes the number one is <coughs> adverse drug events, okay? Uh, adverse effects as far as procedures are concerned and then nosocomal complications. And nosocomal means hospital acquired and a second so we give this to you for free okay so you come in and that second we'll give you MRSA or an infection or a, a urinary tract infection or pneumonia so all of those are free okay all right so okay all right there's another I issue and as far as iatrogenesis is concerned and that the initial medical intervention may actually set off a series of negative events and this is called cascade iatrogenesis uh, and it's like it kind of triggers a kind of decline um, and frequently it's impossible to reverse, okay? And it occurs, occurs frequently in the oldest, most ill, and the most impaired. And this is actually a, just a, a little as far as the case study is concerned, so that you have, a, uh, and a second, so as far as this is concerned, it's just kind of giving you an idea. So the patient um, comes in and has maybe a surgical procedure done uh, frequently as far as we know that um, as far as delirium is concerned, um, very often it's associated with hip 
um, or orth orthopedic surgery. Um, the patient is um, uh, develops some uh, um, delirium um, post-op, and a second then is medicated for agitation. Of course, it's the night shift that's calling uh, for medication, and so it's the um, uh, relief um, uh, uh, physician that is um, trying to um, help the nurses um, as far as this agitation is concerned, and sometimes as far as the dosage of medication is concerned, not always the most optimum. But it's like it's not unusual for the patient to get much larger doses than um, they should, okay? All right, patient becomes extremely um, over-sedated uh, and it's like, and um, it be becomes very difficult to wake. May aspirate, um, aspiration actually leads to pneumonia. When the patient develops pneumonia, then we've got the patient on prolonged bed rest. It's obviously in increasing the amount of time that the patient's in the hospital. Uh, and a second there, we've got the patient on bed rest and a psych and uh, very sick. Then they're functionally declining, they're becoming deconditioned, they're not getting up and moving around. And a second, when I lose muscle mass, I'm going to become much weaker and a psych and have a much higher risk as far as a fall and hip fracture. Okay. All right, and it's like if I fall and fracture my hip, then I'm going to, the, my length of stay obviously is going to increase. Uh, certainly, I've just added more morbidity and mortality to the uh, patient's um, uh, uh, quality of care. And certainly, this patient probably will land up going into a nursing home situation. So certainly, um, and it's like I may never ever uh, get out. So certainly, as far as iatrogenesis is concerned, um, and it's like um, it, it can be quite um, deadly and have a very... Um, bad effect as far as that patient's quality of life. Okay. <coughs> All right. As far as iatrogenic uh, risk factors, and we said um, healthcare providers' attitudes. Uh, and it's like, how can my attitude um, make a change um, or have an effect as far as iatrogenesis is concerned about outcomes relating to my patient? And uh, the first um, thing up there that you see is ageism. What, what does ageism mean to you? Okay, so it's, it's a prejudicial, being prejudiced towards the elderly, okay? Um, or it's like or having negative effects as far as elderly is concerned. When we are looking as far as what are the, um, um, when we're looking at um, the values of our society, of today's society, Western society in the United States, what do we value? What is valued in our society? Productivity. Productivity? Money? Yeah. Okay. All right. And, as I can, and then as far as your ads and um, on TV, uh, and as I can, I'm looking at youth and beauty, and certainly as far as um, uh, and, and money. And so the, the, those seem to be the biggest things that draw value towards um, in our society. As far as the, um, you know, we don't, we don't see too many elderly um, ads on TV. And it's like every now and again I'll see something for Depends, but it's kind of rare. But, uh, but, uh, um, but certainly as far as the elderly are concerned, um, not uh, something that is truly valued. And a second, so as far as the elderly are concerned, what value do elderly patients or people have to our society? What do they bring? I mean, it's like they're, they're obviously they're not out partying at two o'clock in the morning. It's like they're not spending money on clothes and, and knowledge and, knowledge and, and wisdom. They do volunteer, yes. Experience. Their experience and wisdom is, is something they have. And it's like, and, but you're right. And it's like, and so the one thing that they do, and it's like, if you look at our society, and it's like, when we look at um, um, uh, the, the community, and it's like, when we're looking at, you know, who's doing the volunteering out there? Um, who's doing the volunteering relating to um, going to the nursing home visits and, um, volunteering at the um, all of the organizations 
church organizations, uh, political organizations. So basically the elderly, I'm saying the elderly, but it's like 65 and older, and so these, these, you know, we categorize elderly, 65 and older. But they're definitely out there. They are very productive. And it's like right now it's winter and it's like we've got snowbirds. Okay, so the snowbirds are down here and it's like, and they are contributing to the economy of Galveston by spending their money at the restaurants and at the campsites and uh, um, grocery stores, uh, going out to, um, and it's like, and they like to travel. So they are spending money on cruises and doing all the wonderful things. So it's like, so as far as economy and money is concerned, they're out there spending. So that they do contribute, except for the fact that we tend not to look at them um, with the same perspective that we look at um, somebody that is young. But certainly as far as um, ageism is concerned, um, you know, if, if we have a negative uh, idea as far as the elderly are concerned or aging is concerned, that ageism or that negative effect, even though we may not say anything and it's like our body language and the attitudes that we use are, will project onto our patients as we are taking care of them. Okay. Um, certainly um, as far as uh, uh, an attitude that, you know, if I see a patient and I think that they're all chronically ill and very frail. Um, I, my, you know, am I going to be as aggressive um, in getting them up and moving them and, and, and helping them to get well? Or, um, and, as I can, and am I going to be as quick and as aggressive in implementing treatment? And sometimes I see that we hold back a little bit and it's like it may be two days before we decide to really jump in and, and, and really become quite aggressive with what we're doing. <coughs> Um, so, but certainly as far as that, if I feel that the patient is, you know, chronically ill and very frail, and it's like I'm going to be less likely, and as far as nursing is concerned, to get that patient up and moving and to be as um, um, proactive as I would with somebody that was younger, okay. Um, certainly, um, the literature also looks at the potential of fear of na narcotic dependence. Uh, so therefore, I'm not going to treat pain in the same way. Uh, and especially as far as dementia patients are concerned, we find that dementia patients are oftentimes not medicated in the same way that um, uh, other patients would be. Uh, but certainly there's always that fear of narcotic dependence, so I'm going to be very, very skeptical as far as what, do, what is it that I'm doing to um, help as far as pain medications are concerned. Um, certainly when we are um, less likely to treat our patients um, as far as pain management is concerned, it does create much more depression in our um, patients. Okay. Um, and um, certainly um, as far as the, our aging patients are concerned, we do tend to promote a lot more bed rest than what we should. And it's like in our studies that we have done as far as our ACE unit um, is concerned, um, uh, show that the, on an average patients that are um, on the ACE unit walk around uh, 500 steps a day, whereas if they were out in the community, uh, they would walk for 5,000 steps. So certainly as far as movement is concerned and um, uh, get, uh, getting these people up and moving them, and it's like we tend to do not do as well. And it is very hard to get them out of the rooms and walking, but it's like it's something that we really do need to um, push. Um, certainly as far as the perpetuance of uh, dependency and you know as far as our elderly patients are concerned they are a little bit slower and it's like and when you're going in to give medications and it's like it takes you a longer much longer period of time um, as far as bathing and, and providing care is concerned uh, certainly as far as physicians are concerned going in you're trying to get your history and physical and you get your information and you know that their responses are much slower and it takes a long time to get the um, history that you're wanting to get and they're going to diverse and go into you know what happened at Christmas and it's like and so you have to listen to all of this other stuff and it's like I don't have time for all of this oftentimes we tend to uh, miss 
opportunities because it's like we t um, uh, tended not to listen. As far as dependency is concerned, we're finding that, okay, it's like it's time to bathe the patient or, or to um, give them, um, help them with as far as their care is concerned. And we find that it's much quicker to go ahead and bathe that patient, change that bed than it is to allow them to help themselves. So uh, again, um, uh, populating some dependency. And a second, <coughs> certainly as far as our OT people are concerned, right? <laughs> and it's like you are quite opposite, and it's like I'm pushing towards becoming more <coughs> independent, right? I'm not OT. Oh, I, think so. I thought you were OT. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. But certainly as far as OT is concerned, they do push towards uh, making sure that um, our patients try and become more independent, and, and it's like I can do more for themselves. And, um, but it is um, hard uh, as far as the staff is concerned, because it's like you want to get through with your work and, 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 and do a lot more. So sometimes it's easier to do things for them than to allow them to do themselves. Okay. But again, when we're doing that, we're actually stripping them of their uh, identity, of their individuality, and it's like when we're making people more dependent and it's like we're actually um, creating a, a very negative um, um, atmosphere uh, and um, making it more difficult as far as the patient is concerned and predisposing that patient towards depression. Um, as far as adverse drug effects are concerned, this is the most common type of iatrogenesis. Uh, and this is the noxious, unintended, undesirable medication effects, okay? Um, and um, it can be related to, um, to the wrong drug. It can be related to drug-drug interactions. Could be to, related to the uh, dosages and certainly as far as side effects, as far as drugs are concerned too. And certainly, you know, um, when we're looking at our um, uh, patient's medication list, uh, when we're going into t um, medications, and it's like, how many um, medications do you think each patient takes on an average when you're going in to do medicines? Twelve. Twelve is, 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 is a conservative number, so it's like they're at least on twelve medications, and it's not unusual for them to be at least on twenty different medications. And it's like, by the time you're trying to figure out, you know, what interacts with what, what causes what, and it's like, and, and you would really do need to be a, um, have a lot of pharmacy training to be able to tr uh, try and figure some of this out. And it's like, and, and it's like, uh, Dr. Raji's our uh, pharmacy expert there, and it's like, and so um, he's, he's good at tr um, figuring out that, you know, this and this does not go along very well, so it's like he's able to guide um, people with medications, but certainly as far as, um, and I was saying there was a time when we did have a pharmacist on the unit and that really helped, and it's like, but, um, but certainly as far as these patients are concerned, um, uh, the um, side effects as far as drugs are concerned um, are a huge issue. Um, and as I can see, literature is pretty much showing that about 35% of older adults experience some kind of adverse drug effect, okay? and that 50% of those could have been uh, prevented. Um, and the, um, at least one third um, of the iatrogenic um, uh, re uh, related causes um, are in hospitals. Uh, and certainly as far as the polypharmacy is concerned, so, um, and it's like polypharmacy I think is uh, considered anything five medications and more, uh, but it's like, you know, it would be nice if our patients were on five medications, so it's like it would take an awful lot, it would be a lot quicker to give those medications um, than it is when you're on 12 and 20 medications. Uh, certainly as far as procedures are concerned, um, there are, and a second, certainly as far as, you know, you've got more comorbidities as far as your patient is concerned, um, uh, then the chances are that you're going to be doing a lot more medical interventions. And uh, certainly as far as um, procedures are concerned, um, these are, and it's like an x-ray um, uh, procedures and um, cardiac caths, um, uh, these types of things, it does tend to um, prolong the patient's hospital stay, uh, especially if they um, have an adverse ref um, effect um, relating to the procedure. Uh, and it can result as far as disabilities are, is concerned. The, um, the procedures that actually boost the iatrogenic risks are the invasive procedures, um, certainly as far as 
um, promotion of whenever we're giving contrast as far as MRIs are concerned. You know, you're always worried about as far as kidney function is concerned. Uh, um, anything that's to do with radiation. Um, patients that um, uh, are, are going for thoracentesis, um, it's like it's not unusual, um, it's like it's probably about 1% of these will land up with a, um, a collapsed lung. Uh, and it's like in patients who have cardiac catheterizations, um, again, you'll have those patients that will have adverse outcomes from um, just the cardiac catheterization. Although we are seeing less of those, but it still happens. Uh, and certainly as far as patients who have surgical and, and, and periodic pr procedures, uh, certainly we do see a lot more of um, complications uh, relating to those um, situations um, than you would in the um, general population. Even those things that we think are risk-free procedures, um, <clears throat> so that um, safe procedures that we think are safe can be risky to the elderly as well. And so I can say that we have an author that um, uh, pointed out um, three hypos, and it's like, and um, uh, he pointed out that things such as um, patients um, developing hypokalemia in the hospital oftentimes are given fluid without potassium, okay? Antihypertensive uh, anti medications um, taken when the, um, 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 when the patient is laying down when we take the blood pressure um, can lead to hypertension. So his, his suggestion here is that, you know, if we go in and take the blood pressure and the patient's supine and it's like and their, their blood pressure is elevated, that we need to go back in there and have the patient sit up, okay, and take the pla um, blood pressure in that situation rather than on, on the supine. Because it's like what he's saying is that he's seeing that by giving um, blood pressure medications in that situation, we actually increase hypotension. Um, and then certainly as far as poor oral intake on those patients with hypoglycemia, um, and as I can say, if the patient's not eating, uh, and as I can, we're giving um, insulin or we're giving um, um, oral hypoglycemic agents, um, and as I can, we, we do predispose those patients towards hypoglycemia. Um, and certainly as far as, um, you know, a lot of the literature is looking at things such as sliding scale insulin, and as I can, being very careful um, with that, and as I can, or trying to avoid using sliding scale for the simple reason that, um, um, it does um, pre, um, promote hypoglycemic um, uh, situations. Um, the acute renal failure, oftentimes, and it's like the literature is saying 50% of acute renal failure is uh, related to iatrogenic causes, could be related to the fact that we gave them dye, could be the fact that we've got them MPO. Um, and then certainly as far as that prolonged bed rest um, and it's like in that any time that we've got anybody on bed rest and it's like we're losing muscle function, when we're losing mu muscle function, we are deconditioning and it's like and certainly as far as deconditioning is concerned that leads to falls uh, and it's like and to uh, weakness. Um, so it's like it has um, serious effects. Okay. All right, nosocomal complications, and we've talked about um, the no nosocomal um, uh, relates to um, the um, um, hospital-acquired um, infections uh, and complications, and these are, have a much higher uh, frequency in the elderly population, more likely because of the fact that they are already immunosuppressed, okay, uh, and, it's like an, and are sitting ducks for um, um, all of these infections. Uh, the, as, as far as um, going back to as far as nosocomial um, complications are concerned, we talk about as far as infections are concerned, as, uh, and certainly as far as wound infections are concerned, MRSA is one of those, um, and a second VRE. Um, certainly as far as um, uh, some other uh, types of um, nosocomial uh, complications. Um, I'm trying to think um, as far as, it's not just uh, medications, um, but um, other things. What's, what other things can develop um, as far from nosocomal? And a second, and we know that as far as Foley catheters are concerned, right? 
um, they, there is a much higher incidence of, of uh, urinary tract infections. Um, the literature is pretty much um, saying that the, if a patient has a Foley catheter in for uh, less than 48 hours, the chances of developing an infection is, is, is less. If it's more than 48 hours, it is a much greater chance that the patient has become infected. Uh, so certainly as far as surgery patients are concerned, there's a big push to get those catheters out early. Uh, certainly as far as the ACE unit um, is concerned, the nurses know that, you know, to report, you know, that the patient has a Foley. Sometimes um, physicians, as they're doing the rounds, completely miss it, didn't realize that they had one in. And it may have been placed in um, in the emergency room. Uh, and, it's like, and they've gone through the ICU period, and it's like in maybe 10 days um, um, before that Foley comes out. And it's like, and so certainly as far as 10 days is concerned, uh, you're looking at 100% um, chance as far as um, infection is concerned. Um, other areas as far as central lines are concerned, um, any invasive lines that we place in our patients are um, also at high risk as far as infections are concerned. IV sites, um, and again, uh, because of the fact that your patient's immune system is decreased, and it's like they just have a much higher um, incidence as far as infections are concerned. Um, um, I'm going to quickly just kind of mention geriatric syndromes because it's like the literature is also saying that geriatric syndromes are iatrogenic and again um, these are things that, that we um, we can cause so as far as delirium is concerned this is the um, an unusual um, altered um, and um, mental status um, uh, agitation uh, that may have developed uh, suddenly uh, in someone and a second like, certainly as far as delirium is concerned we do see tend to see that, especially with surgery patients, okay? And then the dementia patient is much more likely also to develop um, delirium, okay? Uh, malnutrition, why would patients develop malnutrition in a hospital? One reason they might be in the over days. Okay, all right. It doesn't, oh no, the food doesn't taste good, that's true. And a second, so UTMB is not known for its gourmet cuisine, so. Um, and a second and um, but certainly another issue is can they chew it okay do I have the teeth to chew this what looks like a piece of leather because uh, it's like we're trying to be um, and a second so sometimes the meat is not uh, exactly appetizing so um, and sometimes you know a tray is and a second you know we've had incidents in which um, the nurses are busy the um, the people that are delivering trays will place the tray out of reach of where the patient can reach it, okay? And it's like nobody's had the time to be able to go into the patient's room um, to help with the, with the um, nutrition. And it's like, um, because, you know, other things were happening as far as the unit was concerned. And then dietary comes by, picks up the tray and takes off, and the patient didn't get anything to eat, okay? All right, so that's, those are some um, new, um, things that do happen. Uh, we've seen these things, and it's like, and certainly as far as um, um, malnutrition is concerned, and it's like in that MPO status, and it's like, and so, you know, the minute that the patient comes into the hospital, we're MPOing them, so that they came in, let's say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on, um, what day is today? Today's Wednesday, they came in on Monday, at two o'clock in the afternoon, and they were in the emergency room for a couple of hours, and finally admitted, and then the night flow says, well, let's go ahead and just keep them MPO, so because we'll, um, uh, they may need a cardiac cath or something in the morning, and it's like, and then the team doesn't see them till maybe one or two o'clock in the afternoon, and it's like, and they're not sure that they can get them in, but they will keep them MPO anyway, and we go all the way to five, six o'clock, they forgot, uh, and it's like, the patient's still MPO, and it's like, and then the night float comes on, oh, well, we'll do it tomorrow, so just keep the MPO. And it's like, and so we might go two, three days, and it's like, um, uh, before um, we uh, get some nutrition. Now, the nursing staff knows that, you know, nutrition is very important as far as the elderly patients are concerned, uh, and it's like, and so that we do need to get them um, uh, fed. Um, Certainly as far as depression is concerned, and certainly with anybody that has any kind of chronic disease um, at um, has the potential to become depressed, okay? Um, uh, and especially, you know, if we're isolating them, not going in, if they're not getting uh, much sleep, if they're <coughs> in pain and we're not addressing those pain, um, um, 
it's much more likely that um, uh, depression um, may be there. And sometimes the facts that we're just flat not listening okay, to our patients um, because it's like we don't have the time uh, and it's like and they, they are slow in their response. Okay. Um, one of the questions I ask as far as our nurses is concerned is, you know, why is it that you came into healthcare? What was it that brought you into healthcare? Um, why, why did you decide to become a PT or a, a nurse or a physician? What brought you to this other than a big fat paycheck? So, and it's, I understand geriatrics don't make that big pay fat paychecks not like uh, others do. So what, what brought you into healthcare? I wanted to help people. Okay, so, so helping people that were sick, okay? All right, helping people that were sick or because you cared about people, or had a caring attitude and wanting to care. One of the things that we've noticed is that in today's rush, um, and as far as our computer age is concerned, that sometimes we care more about what's in the computer and getting our facts and every, all the information. And it's like, and that caring aspect has been lost, okay? And I sometimes, and it's like, I went to a physician um, uh, a week ago, uh, and it's like, um, um, and I, I swear that he never took his eyes away from the computer the whole time I was there. The only time that he looked at me was when he examined me and then went back to his computer and, um, and it's like, but the whole time he was talking to me, I never had eye contact and it's like, and I just felt like, you know, I'm not sure that he really cares about what, what's going on um, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So again, bringing, bringing in that caring aspect um, may have a better, something better relating to as far as that depression is concerned. Because if I feel like my doctor doesn't care about me, uh, and it's like, it's kind of hopeless that nobody's going to help me um, with my pain or whatever it is, you know, and it's like, um, uh, um, whenever somebody comes in and it's like, uh, and it's like, and as far as physicians are concerned, and it's like the patient's saying, um, you know, I have, I have some pain, uh, and it's like, and so as far as, um, your assessment as far as pain is concerned, how does that begin? Tell me how you assess pain. The patient says they're having pain. Okay. Intensity. Right. Okay. Duration. And a second, so I'm collecting all of this data because that's like I want to forget. And so, you know, how long have you had this pain? How bad is it? When does it? When when is it? On a scale of one to ten, how bad is it? And it's like, and so we're collecting all of this information, and it's like, you know, tell me all of this. So, you know, having chest pain, it's like I can't breathe, and it's like, and so how bad is it? Where is it? What does it radiate? All of these questions that we're um, uh, looking at. But it's like if instead of asking, jumping straight to those questions, which we need to, and it's like if instead of that we started off with, I am so sorry that you are so uncomfortable, and I'm going to do everything I can to help you as far as so that we can get you more comfortable. I need to ask you some questions relating to the pain so I know what it is. And it's like if I approached it from that aspect, it would have a little bit more caring to it. And it's like, and I would really feel that that doctor really cared about what was going on with me rather than going into um, and it's like, oh yeah, you, you know, this is what the pain is. And it's like, let's x-ray it. And it's like, and, oh yeah, it's arthritis. Not much we can do about that. And it takes off. That's it. So uh, it doesn't give me a very caring um, perspective. So um, being a lot more caring, the way that we, pr we, and it's like, it doesn't take very long. It just takes maybe about 30 more seconds uh, to um, add that caring aspect makes a big difference um, as far as our patients are concerned. Being an active listener. An active listener. And, like, and so all of those things will help as far as depression is concerned. Sleep disorders. And, it's like, and we know that as far as sleep disorders are concerned, there are things out there that, um, you know, we're waking the patient up um, throughout the night. Patients may have sleep apnea, um, uh, certainly as far as being in a, a strange environment, lots of noises. 
um, all of these um, promote um, sleep disorders. A patient doesn't get the sleep that they need, much more grouchy, they're not going to recover as well. Um, so um, certainly as far as sleep is concerned, very important that we um, uh, look as far as sleep is concerned. Certainly as functional decline is concerned, I think that we've already talked about this. Incontinence, um, certainly when I first came on to the ACE unit, one of the things that I found was that nurses were saying, um, well, it's like, let's put our patients there, and then tidy them all up and put them into nice diapers. Okay, so everybody that comes in got, got into a diaper. And it's like, and certainly as far as, you know, patients were saying, and you really need to go to the bathroom. And, the, you know, we, we'd hear things such as, well, you've got a diaper on, so just go ahead and use that. But what it does is it really teaches our patient that it's like it's not important to be continent. And it's like and all of those things that we learned at two as far as how to manage your bladder and control your bladder is lost. Other things that we might see is any time that we have um, Foley's, Foley catheters in for any period of time, sometimes the patients lose their contractility as far as their bladder is concerned. And as I can so um, following removal of the um, Foley's, oftentimes they may be incontinent. Okay. Uh, and certainly as far as falls and injuries are concerned, Medications probably are the um, uh, biggest issues um, as far as falls are concerned, but it's like, and that's uh, something that, that we do need to consider. As far as um, hospital acquired infections, urinary tract infections, uh, bloodstream infections, pneumonia, surgical site infections, all of those are um, um, uh, hospital acquired, and it's like, um, certainly as far as bloodstream infections are concerned, it's the eighth leading cause of death. Uh, and it's like in 50% of bloodstream infections are associated with invasive devices. So, you know, getting those um, central lines out, getting the IVs out, getting catheters out um, as soon as possible, um, it really becomes very important, okay? Uh, certainly as far as pneumonia is concerned, second most common hospital-acquired infection, very much preventable. Um, certainly as far as seen a lot more in the ICUs, as far as ventilators are concerned, it is changing uh, at this point in time because the nursing staff is now doing a lot more oral care uh, relating to those patients, so we are seeing a decrease as far as ventilator-associated uh, pneumonia. Um, I'm not going to go into those, but certainly as far as the old way of caring, um, using those adult diapers and urine catheters uh, for incontinence is changing, and it's like, and it's taken its time to change, but it's like we are becoming a lot more um, um, proactive against um, placing diapers on everybody, and it's like, and certainly as far as placing a catheter in everybody as far as incontinence was concerned. Um, and it's like, and certainly um, I'm doing a lot more um, relating to um, uh, straight caths rather than um, um, promoting a uh, continuous full, um, urinary catheters. Um, certainly as far as chemical restraints, physical restraints um, for agitation, actually, especially with the dementia patients, delirium patients actually makes the, de um, the agitation worse. Uh, and it's like, and so is, uh, should not be considered. And then certainly as far as um, NG tubes, um, for eating in a second, and now um, we're tending to um, uh, take our time as far as getting those um, patients to eat, uh, making sure that the patient can swallow, that there's no um, obstacles uh, relating to any uh, issues relating to swallowing. Um, becoming a lot less um, um, the use of um, sedatives for insomnia. Uh, we still, every now and again, we'll see patients who get, will get um, Benadryl uh, for, uh, for sleep, and it's like, and we know that uh, the nursing staff is um, well aware that they, they uh, should not be um, uh, doing that uh, if they can be avoided. Um, the um, and, and certainly as far as changing those policies, as far as MPOs are concerned, um, we've still got an awful long way to go there, but it's like, but we are working on that. And certainly as far as um, uh, prolonged bed rest is concerned, getting those patients up and moving them. Um, and another thing that um, is in the literature is um, e itrogenesis and this relates to electronic medical records and the use of copy and paste. Um, and it's like which has become the norm for physicians. 
uh, the, this literature is showing that like 82% of residents actually document um, uh, information that is copied into the progress notes. And they're using smart phrases rather than what the um, patient's words are, which may change the actual um, um, uh, note itself. Okay, and it's like, uh, um, but um, you know, I'm not saying s uh, stop copying and pasting, but it's like if you're going to copy and paste, make sure that the information that you're um, putting down is accurate. Okay, um, certainly as far as preventing atrogenesis is concerned, we want to prevent harm. Um, Um, and the second, certainly as far as um, um, being proactive in uh, preventing harm, being holistic uh, in that we're looking at the whole patient, okay, addressing all of the needs, um, collaborati collaborating with all of the interdisciplinary team members, okay, and being much more advocates as far as patients are concerned. So just as far as the goals, as far as inpatient geriatric care is concerned, is to reduce illness and death. Uh, reduce iatrogenesis um, related length of stay, um, kind of um, lower the readmission rates as far as the patients are concerned, uh, and, like, and um, we want to definitely extend the time between discharge and readmission, so in the cycle that does mean um, that we have to be a lot more careful as far as medications are concerned. Um, that as far as transfer to another um, facility, that um, the um, information is relayed um, accurately, uh, and a second, that patients are, have um, um, good teaching. Okay. Uh, and certainly as far as we do want um, families and patients to be a lot more satisfied, satisfaction is, patient satisfaction is a major issue right now because it's like Medicare is saying, if your patient's not satisfied, we're not going to pay you as much. Okay. Um, and then making sure that we do help our patients pr um, properly for discharge. Okay. I'm not going to go into all of this, and it's like um, I just wanted to very quickly um, go into as far as what can you do um, as far as helping patients prevent delirium? Anything that you can think of that would prevent delirium as far as your patients are concerned? Something that you could do. Put their glasses and hearing aids on okay. they have them. Making sure that your patients can see and hear, okay, it's very good. And, and the second, as far as communications are concerned, extremely important, okay. Hydration. Hydration is extremely important as far as our patients are concerned because patients do become dehydrated, okay. What else can we do to, as far as prevention of de um, delirium? Spend more time in the room. Spend more time communicating with them, bringing them back to the reorientating them, and it's like making sure that we um, communicate what is going on and what is happening, decreasing noise, allowing them to sleep. Okay, all right. What things can we do as far as malnutrition is concerned? How can we prevent malnutrition in your patients? How are you going to mal um, prevent it? Major, I'm sorry. I was going to say, make sure they can feed themselves, and if they can't, offering assistance. Okay. All right. So certainly offering assistance as far as nutrition is concerned, making sure that they get the nutrition that they need. If they didn't eat anything on the tray, what are we going to do? Okay, see if we can find something else that they would eat, or offer them supplements, get them supplements, but get them some form of nutrition. Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, as far as depression is concerned, I think that we pretty much went over uh, a lot of things that we can do, certainly as far as communications are concerned, um, being caring, um, and it's like addressing pain needs, okay? Sleep disorders, I think that we went to functional decline. How do we prevent functional decline in our patients? Assist them with the things that they can do so that they go. Get them up and move get them up and move them and it's like that's probably the most important thing that we can do uh, as far as our elderly patients are concerned don't keep them in bed the bed is not the friend get them out of the beds get them moving get them out in the hall tell them that they need to walk around the unit three times okay all right not always is it possible and it's like and some of our patients are very very sick so they can't but um, for those that we can um, do that and certainly as far as incontinence is concerned anything that we can do to promote continence Special, 
scheduled voiding, toileting rounds, and it's like get them to the bathroom. We know as far as our dementia patients, we can decrease falls by taking them to the bathroom every two hours. And it's like not only does it, uh, but it also promotes function and movement. So it's like, uh, and it's like, and um, um, bringing that bladder b training back into um, uh, uh, into use, okay? And then as far as falls and injuries, how do we prevent those? Make sure that their pathway is clear. Okay, now remove any clutter that is in the room. Get the physical therapist to evaluate for appropriate um, assistive device. Okay, so do that early. And it's like, and so have our physical therapist come out and it's like, and so that if we see that our patients has, has declined functionally, get the physical therapy in their area so that we can get them um, moving and it's like, and then they can make the recommendations relating to exercises for these patients, okay. Um, uh, and it's like, and certainly as far as um, we now have hourly rounding. Uh, so making sure that the doors are open, that we can see our patients, making sure that the patient has their stuff where they can reach it. So it's like the call bell isn't placed on the other side of the room or that their tray isn't across the other side of the room where they, they can't reach it. So it's like making sure that everything that they need is within their reach. So all of these little things um, help. But certainly as far as mobility is concerned, these are things that will help as far as falls and injuries are concerned. So um, these are things that you can use and utilize um, uh, and as, I ca um, as far as um, iatrogenic um, uh, things as far as the hospital is concerned. I do have a little handout relating to medications, but as I can, and certainly as far as each of these topics is a whole lecture um, in its own. But as I can, so just kind of wanted to breach these and as I can to uh, at least um, uh, um, put just a little information in um, to um, help you as far as um, decreasing some of the um, geriatric syndromes and iatrogenesis uh, that patients suffer so that um, our patients are much safer as far as their hospital stay is concerned. Okay. And I'm not going to do the cost, um, uh, case study at this point in time. And it's like we will just go ahead because I think I'm out of time at this point. Is that right? Time for a couple questions. Okay. Like. Good. Yes, sir. I have two comments. The first one, when I admitted a patient to the hospital, I figured out whether they should have OT or PT and, and write the order on day one. The second thing, there was a study done recently in ICU, and I don't know whether it was on ventilator patients or non-ventilator patients. They did a muscle biopsy on day one and day seven, and there was marked necrosis. I even have the picture <coughs> of the home, uh, color pictures of the muscle necrosis. That was really disturbing that in seven days, <coughs> you could really damage your muscles badly. And, and some of, I, I guess, that may <coughs> Uh, permanent loss. Yes, and it's very difficult to recover. And it's like, and, and uh, the literature also says that for every day in bed, it takes two days of physical therapy to actually bring back that uh, function that the patient lost. So, um, so, so certainly as far as functional loss is concerned, there's a lot of functional loss that takes place by staying in bed. So don't stay in bed um, or don't keep your patients in bed. Okay. All right. Any other questions? From the sites. Any questions from the sites? I do have a question for you. What would be your plan to increase the awareness? Because you talked about awareness, increasing the awareness among um, the healthcare staff overall. What would be your plan to propose to um, different facilities to increase the awareness? So, um, for different facilities? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, and it is to train more uh, nurses and, and geri uh, uh, practitioners in, as far as geriatric concepts are concerned, and um, to have um, resource people that they can, um, that 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 they will then go out and spread the word relating to geriatrics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, and as I can certainly, we we've um, uh, we are probably about 90% of the nursing staff on the unit now is geriatric trained and, ger and will be geriatric certified. But it's like we need to move past our unit into the whole hospital at this point in time, so that everybody on each unit has somebody that is geriatric uh, certified or geriatric 
resource person that somebody can turn to and say, help me with this patient. Okay. We do have geriatric consults, which um, are very helpful. So certainly as far as our um, uh, geriatricians are concerned, they do um, consults um, for um, our elderly patients on other units. So um, that is helpful too. Another way is uh, the curriculum for undergraduate education for nursing, medicine, physical therapy, vocationals, and so on and so forth. Even if it is only three hours, even if it's only the one slide you have where about the old way of doing things, we don't do this. It will just be enough to make all trainees by the time they finish their nursing medical school, at least have some basic key principles. I mean, it's not every medical student, for instance, who get to do geriatric rotation even here. So the same thing for nursing and PTOT, social and so on. So I think, um, and the justification for that is your slide that says in year 2030, there will be one billion people above the age of 65 in the world. Just think about it. The whole of North Canada, USA, and the whole of Central and South America filled People like us, I mean, not like us, fill with old people. <laughs> Just think about it. Just think of deporting everybody below 65 away from me. And that means, regardless of your specialty, PT, OT, medicine, nursing, you're going to have something to do with people in their 70s and 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. And just knowing some of the key principles is part of rendering good care for these growing populations. And Mary is trying to come up with something to make sure every single <coughs> medical student in the University of Texas Medical School will get some key principle of geriatrics, even when they want to become a neonatologist. <laughs> 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 <laughs>